So for, perhaps for a, a slight change of pace here from broad patterns that scientists have studied to, um, yeah, I was also asked the kind of things that I'm, that I'm worried about these days. And um, so I'm going to tell you about some work that I'm doing with my life and intellectual partner, Beverly Wenger Trainer. Uh, we are um, trying to develop what we call a theory of social learning capability. And I'll try to unpack what that means in terms of what, what we pay attention to. Um, so, um, coming down to really the, the minutiae of how human beings learn in meaningful ways, uh, in ways that, that speaks to them as people who experience life, uh, we started to posit learning as taking place in that, in that relationship between the person and the world. And so when we moved learning from between the ears and placed it in that relationship that a person is, established, uh, uh, is establishing with the world, uh, we started to think learning not simply as the acquisition of information, but learning also as the configuration of who you are, and in the same process, the configuration of the social world as a place to make meaning. And this is where perhaps some of you have heard of this concept of community of practice that my name is, is very much associated with. This idea that when people learn together over time, they configure a social system around the practice that they have developed. And that social system is almost like a local social definition of what counts as competence. And you observe these phenomena wherever you look. You know, you observe these phenomena uh, uh, where, you know, if you look in, a, in, in an organization and you look at a group of engineers uh, talking about how to design this piece of equipment or that piece of equipment, there is a kind of, they've all been to school and they've learned how to be engineers, but they, in their practice, negotiate a local definition of what it means to be good. You know? But you find that also in a street gang, where there's a certain way of walking that really defines you as really competent at being a member of that gang. So you see this definition of competence as being, as being very important. And so you could say that um, a focus on communities of practice pushes you to look at the geography of definition of competence in a landscape of communities of practice. Okay, so let me uh, uh, um, give you an example. If you start thinking about learning as taking place as the configuration of the social world into communities and practices and, and identities, and you start thinking about, you know, how can we think about social learning capability as a characteristic of social system. It can be of a community, it can be of a system of community, it can be of a profession. How can, we, how can the profession learn how to go beyond, beyond sexism? When you think about social learning capability, and you think about the, even the kind of problems that, that our colleagues have been, have been uh, talking about, uh, placing ourselves within the cosmos or, 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 or managing our resources, you could think that those problems are actually problems of social learning capability. Let me give you an example. I was talking about that at the WHO in Geneva, and the doctor, a, a doctor came to me after the talk, and he said, you must be onto something here. Because he said, you know, we know, we know what it takes to save 95% of children under age five in the world today. There is no more research to do. The rest is social learning capability. We don't know how to configure social system such that the necessary learning can take place. I thought he was going to hire me to do that with him, but <laughs> he didn't. <laughs> Which is unfortunate, because the way that I developed my work, I view myself as, as a social learning theorist, the way that I developed my work is, is really by being engaged in practice and by developing the kind of conceptual language that allows people to, to, to develop uh, um, their ability to, to solve problems. So, because I don't do much of the research that, that, that you have seen here, 
uh, for me, a good I, I, practice is the place where a developer can offer research. Because I, I, I'm not here to tell you something that you don't know. I'm more here to talk about developing a perspective that allows you to see certain, certain things in the world. And this is where, in, in, in the social sciences, theory is, is so important because theory is not so much as it is perhaps in, uh, in, in uh, natural science as a matter of being false or true. A theory is more a way of looking. It's, it, it forces you to pay attention. So for us, developing uh, a, a theory of learning capability is more developing the kind of things that you would want to pay attention to. You know, like for instance, uh, uh, when Salim um, was mentioning earlier the, the idea that environmentalists tend to like uh, uh, autocratic regimes because autocratic regimes they, uh, get uh, uh, people to do things. Um, we talk in social learning theory, uh, social learning capability theory, we talk about verticalizing versus horizontalizing uh, 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 knowledge and, and, and learning. And so, for us, as, so, as social learning theorists, we would say, you know, if you verticalize something like you can only have one child or something like that, when, once you verticalize a decision, once you verticalize a piece of knowledge or a piece of agreement, what you're doing is that you are decreasing the learning capability of the system because once something is verticalized, you, you can't engage your meaning-making capability around it anymore because the decision has been made. And, you know, it's not that verticalizing is bad, you know. Like I was in South Africa, you know, and everybody drives on the wrong side of the road, <laughs> and they don't have any more accidents than here in, in, in Wisconsin because it's been verticalized, you know. You don't negotiate every time you, you know, you see another car. Well, which way are we going to decide to cross? It has been simplified by, th by making this decision. But in a case like this, it works very well. Because in, indeed, there's not that much learning that we want to do so, uh, societally by deciding every time. If you're in India, it's a bit different. So, uh, you know, sometimes on the road, you, you, you feel like you know, the first one who's afraid moves out. Of the <laughs> but but what, all, all, all I'm saying is that if you start to pay attention to the learning cost of verticalizing a decision, then you are starting to pay attention to what we could call social learning capability. And we think that because many of the problems that we are facing can be reinterpreted as social learning problems, if you view learning at this, as, at, at this sort of systemic level, uh, it's important to have good ways of talking. So for instance, one of the things that a theory of, of a social learning theory around a notion of community of practice would make you pay attention to is, so where do people develop their identity around issues of competence, you know? And then what kind of boundaries does that create when you have the competence of, you know, a scientific community or the competence of a, of, 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 of a local community, you know, like, how do, you, how do you understand those, those boundaries? What kind of misunderstanding can happen at those boundaries? What, can, what kind of unexpected new learning can happen? And in some sense, what you're doing here is to create a, a mix of people across boundaries of practice in the hope that if people sustain engagement across those boundaries long enough, something will happen, you know? So this idea of paying attention to boundary, paying attention to, to the cost of engaging across boundaries. How long do you want to engage with someone who has no understanding of what you're doing, you know, as opposed to a colleague who really appreciates uh, 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 your competence? So there's a cost from engaging across boundaries. There's a cost from being deep into a local competence. I have a cousin who told me that, that uh, he's a physicist and told me there are 10 people in the world who understand what he's doing. So it's amazing. to to belong to a community that is so deep, if you will, that there are only 10 people who understand uh, uh, what he's doing. So these are the kind of things that, you wanna, that we want to create a way of paying attention to the world such that we can 
see both where different communities um, create systems that decrease the learning capability, but then also using the same theory to say, how can we reconfigure the landscape? Let me give you an example. Uh, two months ago, we were in, um, in uh, South Africa, in, in Cape Town, um, and we were there because uh, uh, an association, well, uh, an organization called the, the Transparency and Accountability Ini Initiative, uh, that's a, a uh, collaborative of foundations that uh, fund projects around the world to increase the transparency of, of public finances uh, in, in different countries. With the idea that if, if uh, public finances are more transparent, our governments will be more accountable, and if the governments are more accountable, they will provide better, better services to their citizens. Okay? Some people in that field, in that, in that uh, uh, collaborative, decided that we need to understand better how we are having an impact and how we are learning about how to have an impact. So what was interesting is that they convened a conversation in Cape Town that brought together funders, uh, civil society organizations, and academics who were doing research on, 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 on the topic to have a conversation of, like, we've been doing this for 20 years. How do we know we are having any effect? And how can we, as a system, learn better how to have an effect? So it was really an interesting step, if you will, in the learning capability of the system by saying we're going to open this new space for conversations. And actually, they wanted to do more than a, a simply opening a space for conversation. They wanted to create a more enduring community of practice where people would be able to develop new practice of funding, new practice of research, new practice of engagement that would allow the field to make progress. So for us, it was a good example of what we call opening a social learning space as an intervention into a system to create a learning capability that didn't exist there before. So in that sense, the notion of community of practice is a kind of social learning space. There are other kind of social learning spaces. Actually, probably the people who organized this big learning event would think, well, we're trying to create a social learning space. We are not committed to it. This is not a community of practice. We're not going to all of a sudden become a community of practice. There's no, whole, there's no, no need for that. You know? But still, it's a moment where we want to create a new kind of conversation, some, something new, and it's, it's in some sense a social reconfiguration because we, we fly in people who, who, who don't necessarily know each other or, 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 or do the same kind of thing. We engage them with each other, we engage with a group, and something, something's going to happen that may change the learning capability of this university. You know? So this is really, really, really interesting. So I guess our work and is, is to, to develop the set of concepts that you want to pay attention to. And, and for instance, another, another concept that we, we are uh, uh, starting to really pay attention to is what we call convening power. The ability, the legitimacy, the kind of resources that it takes to convene a new learning space within the system. You know? Not everybody can do it. It, it depends on, on who you are, the kind of legitimacy you have. So in this case, it worked well because the people who convened that space did have the, the legitimacy to open it and to have something happen in it. That, I, I, I tell you, that was not an easy, that was not an easy thing, you know? Because the, if you think of the relationships that are happening between the practice of funders, the practice of civil society organization, and the practice of researchers, there, there's a lot of renegotiation of like wh whose fault it is that we are not learning as well as, as, as we do. You know, you researchers, you do your research, but you are not answering my problem. You know, you are trying to get your paper published. You know, uh, uh, you civil society organizations, you're not, you're not telling us what problem you are facing. You know, but the reason I'm not telling you the problem you are facing is that if I tell you my problem, I'm, I won't get the next grant. So, <laughs> what I'm saying is that is that, is that there, were a lot of, there was a lot of boundary work to be done, you know? 
to create that, that social learning space. And so uh, we are, actually we have a name for people who are very good at doing that. We call them social artists. Because, you know, like an artist who is able to create a statue that makes a town square very different, these social artists are able to open these spaces where people discover each other as learner, as co-learner, and they can create a space for a new kind of learning partnership. And, you know, I would say that we are starting to really feel a lot of respect for those people, you know. We have found a few of them, and, you know, in this university, you would really kind of worship a great scientist because of the kind of contribution they make to our species' ability to know, you know. We think that down in the trenches, there are people, we call them social artists, who are just contributing as much, but they are contributing in, in the reweaving of our social relationships around the ability to learn together. And so, you know, I just want to tell you, you know, it's like, that's why, that's why theory is so important. Suddenly you, wow, this person is like such a contributor to humankind, you know? So, but we need, to, we need to recognize that. And that's where theory can give us new eyes to see and new, new ways to act. And then, you know, I mean, we don't even have to all be social artists. It would be great, but maybe not necessary, you know? We just have to have enough, enough of them that we, can, that we can reconfigure the meaning-making capability of the, of, of the world. But then we are also recognizing People who are just acting at what we call learning citizens. They use who they are as, as a way to, for instance, after that meeting in, in, uh, in, in, in Cape Town, one civil society organization in Argentina said, well, we have some trouble with our, what they call it the theory of change. So this is how this organization was kind of telling its funders that it, they were going to have an effect on the world and that they deserve they deserve their funding. We have some trouble with our theory of change. We would like to have a, a group consultation with this community. And to me, like, what a beautiful step that was to offer your challenge as a learning opportunity to draw in the, the learning potential of that group. You see what I mean? So it was just a simple step. They didn't think of it as being great, but for us it was like, whoa, what a contribution to this community. To open a challenge that, actually the funders were part, of the, were part of the conversation, but to open that challenge to the whole community and offer it as a, as a learning possibility. So I'd like to leave you with two things. One, if increasing the learning potential, learning, the learning capability of our social system is really essential, then what is the role of the university in that, in that process? Are there new roles for the legitimacy that you have acquired through research and providing uh, uh, unknown information to us, like the age of the universe or whatever was talked about? The legitimacy that you have gained, are there new ways to think about how to, make, how to put it to use? Because you know, some of you were talking about time. I think for me what I'm worried about the long-term perspective is that I'm not sure we have that long uh, to address the kind of problem that Salim was, was talking about. And so there's a kind of urgency, you know, and l increasing the learning capability, accelerating the learning capability of the world is probably an important, an important thing to do. So it would be interesting to know how you can put the legitimacy that you've gained to, to good use there. And the second thing is then the new personally. If you start thinking of yourself as a learning citizen, if you start walking your beautiful city with that question in you, you know, how do the actions that I take contribute or hind contribute to or hinder the learning capability 
of the social system in which I participate? I think that's a beautiful question to carry and an important one. And so I'm inviting you into that question which I have, you know, which I struggle with. You know? uh, I'm, I'm, I wanted to leave you with that question as something that you can uh, uh, carry yourself to. Thank you.